A solar cell, or photovoltaic cell, is an electrical device that converts the energy of light directly into electricity by the photovoltaic effect, which is a physical and chemical phenomenon. It is a form of photoelectric cell, defined as a device whose electrical characteristics, such as current, voltage, or resistance, vary when exposed to light. Individual solar cell devices can be combined to form modules, otherwise known as solar panels. In basic terms a single junction silicon solar cell can produce a maximum open circuit voltage of approximately 0.5 to 0.6 volts. Solar cells are described as being photovoltaic, irrespective of whether the source is sunlight or an artificial light. They are used as a photodetector for example infrared detectors, detecting light or other electromagnetic radiation near the visible range, or measuring light intensity. The operation of a photovoltaic PV cell requires three basic attributes. The absorption of light, generating either electron-hole pairs or excitons. The separation of charge carriers of opposite types. The separate extraction of those carriers to an external circuit. In contrast, a solar thermal collector supplies heat by absorbing sunlight, for the purpose of either direct heating or indirect electrical power generation from heat. A photoelectrolytic cell. Photoelectrochemical cell, on the other hand, refers either to a type of photovoltaic cell like that developed by Edmund Becquerel and modern dye-sensitized solar cells, or to a device that splits water directly into hydrogen and oxygen using only solar illumination. Applications. <laughs> <laughs> Assemblies of solar cells are used to make solar modules that generate electrical power from sunlight, as distinguished from a solar thermal module or solar hot water panel. A solar array generates solar power using solar energy. Cells, modules, panels and systems Multiple solar cells in an integrated group, all oriented in one plane, constitute a solar photovoltaic panel or module. Photovoltaic modules often have a sheet of glass on the sun-facing side, allowing light to pass while protecting the semiconductor wafers. Solar cells are usually connected in series and parallel circuits or series in modules, creating an additive voltage. Connecting cells in parallel yields a higher current, however, problems such as shadow effects can shut down the weaker less illuminated parallel string a number of series connected cells, causing substantial power loss and possible damage because of the reverse bias applied to the shadowed cells by their illuminated partners. Strings of series cells are usually handled independently and not connected in parallel, though as of 2014, individual power boxes are often supplied for each module, and are connected in parallel. Although modules can be interconnected to create an array with the desired peak DC voltage and loading current capacity, using independent MPPTs maximum power point trackers is preferable. Otherwise, shunt diodes can reduce shadowing power loss in arrays with series, parallel connected cells. History 
The photovoltaic effect was experimentally demonstrated first by French physicist Edmond Becquerel. In 1839, at age 19, he built the world's first photovoltaic cell in his father's laboratory. Willoughby Smith first described the effect of light on selenium during the passage of an electric current. In a 20 February 1873 issue of Nature. In 1883 Charles Fritz built the first solid-state photovoltaic cell by coating the semiconductor selenium with a thin layer of gold to form the junctions, the device was only around 1% efficient. Other milestones include 1888 – Russian physicist Alexander Stoltov built the first cell based on the outer photoelectric effect discovered by Heinrich Hertz in 1887. 1905 – Albert Einstein proposed a new quantum theory of light and explained the photoelectric effect in a landmark paper, for which he received the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1921. 1941 – Vadim Lashkaryov discovered p-n junctions in and protocells. 1946 – Russell Ohl patented the modern junction semiconductor solar cell, while working on the series of advances that would lead to the transistor. 1954 – The first practical photovoltaic cell was publicly demonstrated at Bell Laboratories. The inventors were Calvin Souther Fuller, Darrell Chapin and Gerald Pearson. 1958 – Solar cells gained prominence with their incorporation onto the Vanguard I satellite. Topic: Space applications. Solar cells were first used in a prominent application when they were proposed and flown on the Vanguard satellite in 1958 as an alternative power source to the primary battery power source. By adding cells to the outside of the body, the mission time could be extended with no major changes to the spacecraft or its power systems. In 1959 the United States launched Explorer 6, featuring large wing-shaped solar arrays, which became a common feature in satellites. These arrays consisted of 9,600 Hoffman solar cells. By the 1960s, solar cells were and still are the main power source for most Earth-orbiting satellites and a number of probes into the solar system, since they offered the best power-to-weight ratio. However, this success was possible because in the space application, power system costs could be high, because space users had few other power options, and were willing to pay for the best possible cells. The space power market drove the development of higher efficiencies in solar cells up until the National Science Foundation research applied to national needs. Program began to push development of solar cells for terrestrial applications. In the early 1990s the technology used for space solar cells diverged from the silicon technology used for terrestrial panels, with the spacecraft application shifting to gallium arsenide-based IIIV semiconductor materials, which then evolved into the modern IIIV multijunction photovoltaic cell used on spacecraft. Topic. Price reductions Improvements were gradual over the 1960s. 
This was also the reason that costs remained high, because space users were willing to pay for the best possible cells, leaving no reason to invest in lower cost, less efficient solutions. The price was determined largely by the semiconductor industry. Their move to integrated circuits in the 1960s led to the availability of larger buels at lower relative prices. As their price fell, the price of the resulting cells did as well. These effects lowered 1971 cell costs to some $100 per watt. In late 1969, Elliott Berman joined Exxon's task force, which was looking for projects 30 years in the future, and in April 1973, he founded Solar Power Corporation, a wholly owned subsidiary of Exxon at that time. The group had concluded that electrical power would be much more expensive by 2000, and felt that this increase in price would make alternative energy sources more attractive. He conducted a market study and concluded that a price per watt of about $20 per watt would create significant demand. The team eliminated the steps of polishing the wafers and coating them with an anti-reflective layer, relying on the rough sawn wafer surface. The team also replaced the expensive materials and hand wiring used in space applications with a printed circuit board on the back, acrylic plastic on the front, and silicone glue between the two. Potting. The cells. Solar cells could be made using cast-off material from the electronics market. By 1973 they announced a product, and SPC convinced Tideland Signal to use its panels to power navigational buoys, initially for the U.S. Coast Guard. Research and industrial production Research into solar power for terrestrial applications became prominent with the U.S. National Science Foundation's Advanced Solar Energy Research and Development Division within the Research Applied to National Needs program, which ran from 1969 to 1977, and funded research on developing solar power for ground electrical power systems. A 1973 conference, the Cherry Hill Conference, set forth the technology goals required to achieve this goal and outlined an ambitious project for achieving them, kicking off an applied research program that would be ongoing for several decades. The program was eventually taken over by the Energy Research and Development Administration ERDA, which was later merged into the U.S. Department of Energy. Following the 1973 oil crisis, oil companies used their higher profits to start or buy solar firms, and were for decades the largest producers. Exxon, Arco, Shell, Amoco later purchased by BP and Mobil all had major solar divisions during the 1970s and 1980s. Technology companies also participated, including General Electric, Motorola, IBM, Tyco and RCA. <laughs> Declining costs and exponential growth Adjusting for inflation, it cost $96 per watt for a solar module in the mid-1970s. 
Process improvements and a very large boost in production have brought that figure down 99% to 68 per watt in 2016, according to data from Bloomberg New Energy Finance. Swanson's law is an observation similar to Moore's law that states that solar cell prices fall 20% for every doubling of industry capacity. It was featured in an article in the British weekly newspaper The Economist in late 2012. Further improvements reduced production cost to under $1 per watt, with wholesale costs well under $2. Balance of system costs were then higher than those of the panels. Large commercial arrays could be built, as of 2010, at below $3.40 a watt, fully commissioned, as the semiconductor industry moved to ever larger buells, older equipment became inexpensive. Cell sizes grew as equipment became available on the surplus market. Arco Solar's original panels used cells 2 to 4 inches, 50 to 100 millimeters in diameter. Panels in the 1990s and early 2000s generally used 125 mm wafers. Since 2008, almost all new panels use 156 mm cells. The widespread introduction of flat screen televisions in the late 1990s and early 2000s led to the wide availability of large, high quality glass sheets to cover the panels. During the 1990s, polysilicon poly cells became increasingly popular. These cells offer less efficiency than their monosilicon. Mono counterparts, but they are grown in large vats that reduce cost. By the mid-2000s, poly was dominant in the low-cost panel market, but more recently the mono returned to widespread use. Manufacturers of wafer-based cells responded to high silicon prices in 2004–2008 with rapid reductions in silicon consumption. In 2008, according to Jeff Portmans, director of IMEC's Organic and Solar Department, current cells use 8 to 9 grams to 0.32 ounces of silicon per watt of power generation, with wafer thicknesses in the neighborhood of 200 microns. Crystalline silicon panels dominate worldwide markets and are mostly manufactured in China and Taiwan. By late 2011, a drop in European demand dropped prices for crystalline solar modules to about $1.09 per watt down sharply from 2010. Prices continued to fall in 2012, reaching 62 cents per watt by 4Q2012. Solar PV is growing fastest in Asia, with China and Japan currently accounting for half of worldwide deployment. Global installed PV capacity reached at least 301 gigawatts in 2016, and grew to supply 1.3% of global power by 2016. In fact, the harnessed energy of silicon solar cells at the cost of a dollar has surpassed its oil counterpart since 2004. It was anticipated that electricity from PV will be competitive with wholesale electricity costs all across Europe and the energy payback time of crystalline silicon modules can be reduced to below 0.5 years by 2020. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Subsidies and grid parity. Solar-specific feed-in tariffs vary by country and within countries. Such tariffs encourage the development of solar power projects. 
Widespread grid parity, the point at which photovoltaic electricity is equal to or cheaper than grid power without subsidies, likely requires advances on all three fronts. Proponents of solar hope to achieve grid parity first in areas with abundant sun and high electricity costs such as in California and Japan. In 2007 BP claimed grid parity for Hawaii and other islands that otherwise use diesel fuel to produce electricity. George W. Bush set 2015 as the date for grid parity in the U.S. The Photovoltaic Association reported in 2012 that Australia had reached grid parity ignoring feed-in tariffs, the price of solar panels fell steadily for 40 years, interrupted in 2004 when high subsidies in Germany drastically increased demand there and greatly increased the price of purified silicon which is used in computer chips as well as solar panels. The recession of 2008 and the onset of Chinese manufacturing caused prices to resume their decline. In the four years after January 2008 prices for solar modules in Germany dropped from €3 Euros to €1 Euro per peak watt. During that same time production capacity surged with an annual growth of more than 50%. China increased market share from 8% in 2008 to over 55% in the last quarter of 2010. In December 2012 the price of Chinese solar panels had dropped to 60 cents per WP crystalline modules, the abbreviation WP stands for Watt Peak Capacity, or the maximum capacity under optimal conditions. As of the end of 2016, it was reported that spot prices for assembled solar panels not cells had fallen to a record low of 36 cents per WP. The second largest supplier, Canadian Solar Inc., had reported costs of 37 cents per WP in the third quarter of 2016, having dropped 2 cents from the previous quarter, and hence was probably still at least breaking even. Many producers expected costs would drop to the vicinity of 30 cents by the end of 2017. It was also reported that new solar installations were cheaper than coal-based thermal power plants in some regions of the world, and this was expected to be the case in most of the world within a decade. Theory The solar cell works in several steps. Photons in sunlight hit the solar panel and are absorbed by semiconducting materials, such as silicon. Electrons are excited from their current molecular, atomic orbital. Once excited an electron can either dissipate the energy as heat and return to its orbital or travel through the cell until it reaches an electrode. Current flows through the material to cancel the potential and this electricity is captured. The chemical bonds of the material are vital for this process to work, and usually silicon is used in two layers, one layer being doped with boron, the other phosphorus. These layers have different chemical electric charges and subsequently both drive and direct the current of electrons. An array of solar cells converts solar energy into a usable amount of direct current DC electricity. An inverter can convert the power to alternating current AC. The most commonly known solar cell is configured as a large area PN junction made from silicon. 
Other possible solar cell types are organic solar cells, dye-sensitized solar cells, perovskite solar cells, quantum dot solar cells etc. The illuminated side of a solar cell generally has a transparent conducting film for allowing light to enter into active material and to collect the generated charge carriers. Typically, films with high transmittance and high electrical conductance such as indium tin oxide, conducting polymers or conducting nanowire networks are used for the purpose. Efficiency Solar cell efficiency may be broken down into reflectance efficiency, thermodynamic efficiency, charge carrier separation efficiency and conductive efficiency. The overall efficiency is the product of these individual metrics. The power conversion efficiency of a solar cell is a parameter which is defined by the fraction of incident power converted into electricity. A solar cell has a voltage dependent efficiency curve, temperature coefficients, and allowable shadow angles. Due to the difficulty in measuring these parameters directly, other parameters are substituted, thermodynamic efficiency, quantum efficiency, integrated quantum efficiency, VOC ratio, and fill factor. Reflectance losses are a portion of quantum efficiency under external quantum efficiency. Recombination losses make up another portion of quantum efficiency, VOC ratio, and fill factor. Resistive losses are predominantly categorized under fill factor, but also make up minor portions of quantum efficiency, VOC ratio. The fill factor is the ratio of the actual maximum obtainable power to the product of the open circuit voltage and short circuit current. This is a key parameter in evaluating performance. In 2009, typical commercial solar cells had a fill factor greater than 0.70. Grade B cells were usually between 0.4 and 0.7. Cells with a high fill factor have a low equivalent series resistance and a high equivalent shunt resistance, so less of the current produced by the cell is dissipated in internal losses. Single PN junction crystalline silicon devices are now approaching the theoretical limiting power efficiency of 33.16%, noted as the Shockley Quisa limit in 1961. In the extreme, with an infinite number of layers, the corresponding limit is 86% using concentrated sunlight. In 2014, three companies broke the record of 25.6% for a silicon solar cell. Panasonic's was the most efficient. The company moved the front contacts to the rear of the panel, eliminating shaded areas. In addition they applied thin silicon films to the high quality silicon wafers front and back to eliminate defects at or near the wafer surface in 2015 a four junction GAINP gallium 3 arsenide GANASP GANAS solar cell achieved a new laboratory record efficiency of 46 1% concentration ratio of sunlight equals 312 in a French-German collaboration between the Fraunhofer Institute for Solar Energy Systems Fraunhofer Eyes, CEA Letty and SOITEC. In September 2015, Fraunhofer Eyes announced the achievement of an efficiency above 20% for epitaxial wafer cells. 
The work on optimizing the atmospheric pressure chemical vapor deposition in-line production chain was done in collaboration with Nexwave GmbH, a company spun off from Fraunhofer Eyes to commercialize production. For triple junction thin film solar cells, the world record is 13.6%. Set in June 2015, in 2016, Researchers at Fraunhofer Eyes announced a GAINP, gallium-3 arsenide, C triple junction solar cell with two terminals reaching 30.2% efficiency without concentration. In 2017, a team of researchers at National Renewable Energy Laboratory NREL, EPFL and CSEM Switzerland reported record one sun efficiencies of 32.8% for dual junction GAINP, gallium-3 arsenide solar cell devices. In addition, the dual junction device was mechanically stacked with a C solar cell, to achieve a record one sun efficiency of 35.9% for triple junction solar cells. Topic Materials Equals Solar cells are typically named after the semiconducting material they are made of. These materials must have certain characteristics in order to absorb sunlight. Some cells are designed to handle sunlight that reaches the Earth's surface, while others are optimized for use in space. Solar cells can be made of only one single layer of light-absorbing material single junction, or use multiple physical configurations multi -junctions to take advantage of various absorption and charge separation mechanisms. Solar cells can be classified into first, second and third generation cells. The first generation cells, also called conventional, traditional or wafer-based cells, are made of crystalline silicon, the commercially predominant PV technology, that includes materials such as polysilicon and monocrystalline silicon. Second generation cells are thin film solar cells, that include amorphous silicon, cadmium telluride and SIGS cells and are commercially significant in utility scale photovoltaic power stations, building integrated photovoltaics or in small standalone power system. The third generation of solar cells includes a number of thin film technologies often described as emerging photovoltaics. Most of them have not yet been commercially applied and are still in the research or development phase. Many use organic materials, often organometallic compounds as well as inorganic substances. Despite the fact that their efficiencies had been low and the stability of the absorber material was often too short for commercial applications, there is a lot of research invested into these technologies as they promise to achieve the goal of producing low-cost, high-efficiency solar cells. Topic: <laughs> Crystalline silicon. By far, the most prevalent bulk material for solar cells is crystalline silicon CC, also known as solar-grade silicon. Bulk silicon is separated into multiple categories according to crystallinity and crystal size in the resulting ingot, ribbon or wafer. These cells are entirely based around the concept of a PN junction. Solar cells made of CC are made from wafers between 160 and 240 micrometers thick. <laughs> 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 
Topic: <laughs> Monocrystalline silicon. Monocrystalline silicon mono -C solar cells are more efficient and more expensive than most other types of cells. The corners of the cells look clipped, like an octagon, because the wafer material is cut from cylindrical ingots, that are typically grown by the Chakralsky process. Solar panels using mono-C cells display a distinctive pattern of small white diamonds. <laughs> Epitaxial silicon development Epitaxial wafers of crystalline silicon can be grown on a monocrystalline silicon seed. Wafer by chemical vapor deposition CVD, and then detached as self-supporting wafers of some standard thickness e 250 micrometers that can be manipulated by hand, and directly substituted for wafer cells cut from monocrystalline silicon ingots. Solar cells made with this curfless Technique can have efficiencies approaching those of wafer cut cells, but at appreciably lower cost if the CVD can be done at atmospheric pressure in a high throughput inline process. The surface of epitaxial wafers may be textured to enhance light absorption. In June 2015, it was reported that heterojunction solar cells grown epitaxially on N type monocrystalline silicon wafers had reached an efficiency of 22.5% over a total cell area of 243.4 cm. 2 display style carrot 2 topic polycrystalline silicon Polycrystalline silicon, or multicrystalline silicon multi -C cells are made from cast square ingots large blocks of molten silicon carefully cooled and solidified they consist of small crystals giving the material its typical metal flake effect. Polysilicon cells are the most common type used in photovoltaics and are less expensive, but also less efficient, than those made from monocrystalline silicon. <laughs> Ribbon silicon. Ribbon silicon is a type of polycrystalline silicon. It is formed by drawing flat thin films from molten silicon and results in a polycrystalline structure. These cells are cheaper to make than multi-C, due to a great reduction in silicon waste, as this approach does not require sawing from ingots. However, they are also less efficient. Topic: Mono-like multi-silicon (MLM). This form was developed in the 2000s and introduced commercially around 2009. Also called cast mono, this design uses polycrystalline casting chambers with small seeds of mono material. The result is a bulk mono-like material that is polycrystalline around the outsides. When sliced for processing, the inner sections are high-efficiency mono-like cells but square instead of clipped, while the outer edges are sold as conventional poly. This production method results in mono-like cells at poly-like prices. Topic: Thin film. Thin film technologies reduce the amount of active material in a cell. 
Most designs sandwich active material between two panes of glass. Since silicon solar panels only use one pane of glass, thin film panels are approximately twice as heavy as crystalline silicon panels, although they have a smaller ecological impact determined from life cycle analysis. Topic: <laughs> Cadmium telluride Cadmium telluride is the only thin film material so far to rival crystalline silicon in cost. Watt. However, cadmium is highly toxic and tellurium anion telluride supplies are limited. The cadmium present in the cells would be toxic if released. However, release is impossible during normal operation of the cells and is unlikely during fires in residential roofs. A square meter of cadmium telluride contains approximately the same amount of CD as a single C-cell nickel cadmium battery, in a more stable and less soluble form. Copper indium gallium selenide Copper indium gallium selenide is a direct band gap material. It has the highest efficiency approximately 20 among all commercially significant thin film materials see SIGS solar cell. Traditional methods of fabrication involve vacuum processes including co-evaporation and sputtering. Recent developments at IBM and Nanosolar attempt to lower the cost by using non-vacuum solution processes. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Silicon thin film Silicon thin film cells are mainly deposited by chemical vapor deposition, typically plasma enhanced PCVD from silane gas and hydrogen gas. Depending on the deposition parameters, this can yield amorphous silicon, a C or a C H, protocrystalline silicon or nanocrystalline silicon, NCC or NCC H, also called microcrystalline silicon. Amorphous silicon is the most well-developed thin film technology to date. An amorphous silicon a C solar cell is made of non-crystalline or microcrystalline silicon. Amorphous silicon has a higher band gap than crystalline silicon CC which means it absorbs the visible part of the solar spectrum more strongly than the higher power density infrared portion of the spectrum. The production of a C-thin film solar cells uses glass as a substrate and deposits a very thin layer of silicon by plasma-enhanced chemical vapor deposition PECVD. Protocrystalline silicon with a low volume fraction of nanocrystalline silicon is optimal for high open circuit voltage. NCC has about the same band gap as CC and NCC and a C can advantageously be combined in thin layers, creating a layered cell called a tandem cell. The top cell in a C absorbs the visible light and leaves the infrared part of the spectrum for the bottom cell in NCC. Gallium arsenide thin film The semiconductor material gallium arsenide, gallium arsenide is also used for single crystalline thin film solar cells. Although gallium-3 arsenide cells are very expensive, they hold the world's record in efficiency for a single junction solar cell at 28.8%. 
Gallium-3 arsenide is more commonly used in multijunction photovoltaic cells for concentrated photovoltaics CPV, HCPV, and for solar panels on spacecrafts, as the industry favors efficiency over cost for space-based solar power. Based on the previous literature and some theoretical analysis, there are several reasons why gallium-3 arsenide has such high power conversion efficiency. First, gallium-3 arsenide bandgap is 1.43 eV which is almost ideal for solar cells. Second, because gallium is a byproduct of the smelting of other metals, gallium-3 arsenide cells are relatively insensitive to heat and it can keep high efficiency when temperature is quite high. Third, gallium-3 arsenide has the wide range of design options. Using gallium-3 arsenide as active layer in solar cell, engineers can have multiple choices of other layers which can better generate electrons and holes in gallium-3 arsenide. <laughs> Multijunction cells Multi-junction cells consist of multiple thin films, each essentially a solar cell grown on top of another, typically using metal-organic vapor phase epitaxy. Each layer has a different band gap energy to allow it to absorb electromagnetic radiation over a different portion of the spectrum. Multi-junction cells were originally developed for special applications such as satellites and space exploration, but are now used increasingly in terrestrial concentrator photovoltaics CPV, an emerging technology that uses lenses and curved mirrors to concentrate sunlight onto small, highly efficient multi-junction solar cells. By concentrating sunlight up to a thousand times, high concentrated photovoltaics HCPV has the potential to outcompete conventional solar PV in the future. Tandem solar cells based on monolithic, series connected, gallium indium phosphide, GAINP, gallium arsenide, gallium 3 arsenide, and germanium GEPN junctions are increasing sales, despite cost pressures. Between December 2006 and December 2007, the cost of 4N gallium metal rose from about $350 per kilogram to $680 per kilogram. Additionally, germanium metal prices have risen substantially to $1,000 minus $1,200 per kilogram this year. Those materials include gallium 4N, 6N and 7N gar, arsenic 4N, 6N and 7N and germanium, pyrolytic boron nitride PBN crucibles for growing crystals, and boron oxide. These products are critical to the entire substrate manufacturing industry. A triple junction cell, for example, may consist of the semiconductors gallium-3 arsenide, GE, and GAINP2. Triple junction gallium-3 arsenide solar cells were used as the power source of the Dutch four-time World Solar Challenge winners Nuna in 2003, 2005 and 2007 and by the Dutch solar cars Salutra 2005, 21, 2007 and 21 Revolution 2009. Gallium-3 arsenide-based multi-junction devices are the most efficient solar cells to date. On 15 October 2012, triple-junction metamorphic cells reached a record high of 44%. 
GAINP C dual junction solar cells In 2016, a new approach was described for producing hybrid photovoltaic wafers combining the high efficiency of IIIV multi-junction solar cells with the economies and wealth of experience associated with silicon. The technical complications involved in growing the IIIV material on silicon at the required high temperatures, a subject of study for some 30 years, are avoided by epitaxial growth of silicon on gallium-3 arsenide at low temperature by plasma-enhanced chemical vapor deposition PECVD. C single junction solar cells have been widely studied for decades and are reaching their practical efficiency of approximately 26% under one sun conditions. Increasing this efficiency may require adding more cells with band gap energy larger than 1.1 electron volts to the C cell, allowing to convert short wavelength photons for generation of additional voltage. A dual junction solar cell with a band gap of 1.6 to 1.8 electron volts as a top cell can reduce thermalization loss, produce a high external radiative efficiency and achieve theoretical efficiencies over 45%. A tandem cell can be fabricated by growing the GAIN P and C cells. Growing them separately can overcome the 4% lattice constant mismatch between C and the most common IIIV layers that prevent direct integration into one cell. The two cells therefore are separated by a transparent glass slide so the lattice mismatch does not cause strain to the system. This creates a cell with four electrical contacts and two junctions that demonstrated an efficiency of 18.1%. With a LL factor FF of 76.2%, the C bottom cell reaches an FCNC of 11.7% plus or minus 0.4 in the tandem device, resulting in a cumulative tandem cell FCNC of 29.8%. This FCNC exceeds the theoretical limit of 29.4% and the record experimental FCNC value of a C1 sun solar cell, and is also higher than the record FCNC 1 sun gallium-3 arsenide device. However, using a gallium-3 arsenide substrate is expensive and not practical. Hence researchers try to make a cell with two electrical contact points and one junction, which does not need a gallium-3 arsenide substrate. This means there will be direct integration of GAIN P and C. <laughs> Research in solar cells Topic: Perovskite solar cells. Perovskite solar cells are solar cells that include a perovskite structured material as the active layer. Most commonly, this is a solution processed hybrid organic inorganic tin or lead halide based material. Efficiencies have increased from below 5% at their first usage in 2009 to over 20% 20 in 2014, making them a very rapidly advancing technology and a hot topic in the solar cell field. Perovskite solar cells are also forecast to be extremely cheap to scale up, making them a very attractive option for commercialization. 
So far most types of perovskite solar cells have not reached sufficient operational stability to be commercialized, although many research groups are investigating ways to solve this. <laughs> Bifacial solar cells With a transparent rear side, bifacial solar cells can absorb light from both the front and rear sides. Hence, they can produce more electricity than conventional monofacial solar cells. The first patent of bifacial solar cells was filed by Japanese researcher Hiroshi Mori, in 1966. Later, it is said that Russia was the first to deploy bifacial solar cells in their space program in the 1970s. In 1976, the Institute for Solar Energy of the Technical University of Madrid, began a research program for the development of bifacial solar cells led by Prof. Antonio Luque. Based on 1977 U.S. and Spanish patents by Luque, a practical bifacial cell was proposed with a front face as anode and a rear face as cathode. In previously reported proposals and attempts, both faces were anodic and interconnection between cells was complicated and expensive. In 1980, Andres Cuevas, a PhD student in Luque's team, demonstrated experimentally a 50% increase in output power of bifacial solar cells, relative to identically oriented and tilted monofacial ones, when a white background was provided. In 1981 the company Isophoton was founded in Morlaga to produce the developed bifacial cells, thus becoming the first industrialization of this PV cell technology. With an initial production capacity of 300 kW per year, of bifacial solar cells, early landmarks of Isophoton's production were the 20 kWp power plant in San Agustín de Guadalix, built in 1986 for Iberdrola, and an off-grid installation by 1988 also of 20 kWp in the village of Noto Guye de Ama, Senegal funded by the Spanish International Aid and Cooperation Programs. Due to the reduced manufacturing cost, companies have again started to produce commercial bifacial modules since 2010. By 2017, there were at least eight certified PV manufacturers providing bifacial modules in North America. It has been predicted by the International Technology Roadmap for Photovoltaics that the global market share of bifacial technology will expand from less than 5% in 2016 to 30% in 2027, due to the significant interest in the bifacial technology. A recent study has investigated the performance and optimization of bifacial solar modules worldwide. The results indicate that, across the globe, ground-mounted bifacial modules can only offer approximately 10% gain in annual electricity yields compared to the monofacial counterparts for a ground albedo coefficient of 25% typical for concrete and vegetation ground covers. However, the gain can be increased to approximately 30% by elevating the module 1 meter above the ground and enhancing the ground albedo coefficient to 50%. Sun et al. also derived a set of empirical equations that can optimize bifacial solar modules analytically. An online simulation tool is available to model the performance of bifacial modules in any arbitrary location across the entire world. 
It can also optimize bifacial modules as a function of tilt angle, azimuth angle, and elevation above the ground. Topic: <laughs> Intermediate band Intermediate band photovoltaics in solar cell research provides methods for exceeding the shockley quiesa limit on the efficiency of a cell. It introduces an intermediate band energy level in between the valence and conduction bands. Theoretically, introducing an IB allows two photons with energy less than the band gap to excite an electron from the valence band to the conduction band. This increases the induced photocurrent and thereby efficiency. Luque and Marty first derived a theoretical limit for an IB device with one midgap energy level using detailed balance. They assumed no carriers were collected at the IB and that the device was under full concentration. They found the maximum efficiency to be 63.2%, for a bandgap of 1.95 electron volts with the IB 0.71 electron volts from either the valence or conduction band. Under one sun illumination the limiting efficiency is 47%. <inaudible> Liquid inks In 2014, researchers at California Nanosystems Institute discovered using kestorite and perovskite improved electric power conversion efficiency for solar cells. Topic: <laughs> Upconversion and downconversion. Photon upconversion is the process of using two low energy e.g. infrared photons to produce one higher energy photon. Downconversion is the process of using one high energy photon e.g. ultraviolet to produce two lower energy photons. Either of these techniques could be used to produce higher efficiency solar cells by allowing solar photons to be more efficiently used. The difficulty, however, is that the conversion efficiency of existing phosphors exhibiting up or down conversion is low, and is typically narrow band. One upconversion technique is to incorporate lanthanide doped materials ER3+, YB3+, HO3+, or a combination, taking advantage of their luminescence to convert infrared radiation to visible light. Upconversion process occurs when two infrared photons are absorbed by rare earth ions to generate a high energy absorbable photon. As example, the energy transfer upconversion process ETU, consists in successive transfer processes between excited ions in the near infrared. The upconverter material could be placed below the solar cell to absorb the infrared light that passes through the silicon. Useful ions are most commonly found in the trivalent state. Er plus ions have been the most used. Er 3 plus ions absorb solar radiation around 1.54 micrometers. Two Er3 plus ions that have absorbed this radiation can interact with each other through an upconversion process. The excited ion emits light above the C band gap that is absorbed by the solar cell and creates an additional electron hole pair that can generate current. However, the increased efficiency was small. In addition, fluorindate glasses have low phonon energy and have been proposed as suitable matrix doped with HO3 plus ions. Topic: 
Light absorbing dyes Dye-sensitized solar cells DSSCs are made of low-cost materials and do not need elaborate manufacturing equipment, so they can be made in a DIY fashion. In bulk it should be significantly less expensive than older solid-state cell designs. DSSCs can be engineered into flexible sheets and although its conversion efficiency is less than the best thin film cells, its price-performance ratio may be high enough to allow them to compete with fossil fuel electrical generation. Typically a ruthenium metal organic dye is used as a monolayer of light-absorbing material. The dye-sensitized solar cell depends on a mesoporous layer of nanoparticulate titanium dioxide to greatly amplify the surface area 200 to 300 square meters per gram titanium-4 oxide, as compared to approximately 10 square meters per gram of flat single crystal. The photogenerated electrons from the light-absorbing dye are passed on to the N-type titanium-4 oxide and the holes are absorbed by an electrolyte on the other side of the dye. The circuit is completed by a redox couple in the electrolyte, which can be liquid or solid. This type of cell allows more flexible use of materials and is typically manufactured by screen printing or ultrasonic nozzles, with the potential for lower processing costs than those used for bulk solar cells. However, the dyes in these cells also suffer from degradation under heat and UV light and the cell casing is difficult to seal due to the solvents used in assembly. The first commercial shipment of DSSC solar modules occurred in July 2009 from G24I Innovations. Topic: <laughs> Quantum dots. Quantum dot solar cells QDSCs are based on the Gratzel cell, or dye-sensitized solar cell architecture, but employ low band gap semiconductor nanoparticles, fabricated with crystallite sizes small enough to form quantum dots such as CDs, cadmium selenide, antimony 3 sulfide, PBS, etc., instead of organic or organometallic dyes as light absorbers. Due to the toxicity associated with CD and PB based compounds, there are also a series of green QD sensitizing materials in development, such as QINs2, Quincia2, and Quinces. QD's size quantization allows for the band gap to be tuned by simply changing particle size. They also have high extinction coefficients and have shown the possibility of multiple exciton generation. In a QDSC, a mesoporous layer of titanium dioxide nanoparticles forms the backbone of the cell, much like in a DSSC. This titanium-4 oxide layer can then be made photoactive by coating with semiconductor quantum dots using chemical bath deposition, electrophoretic deposition or successive ionic layer adsorption and reaction. The electrical circuit is then completed through the use of a liquid or solid redox couple. The efficiency of QDSCs has increased to over 5% shown for both liquid junction and solid state cells, with a reported peak efficiency of 11.91%. In an effort to decrease production costs, the Prashant Kamat Research Group demonstrated a solar paint made with titanium-4 oxide and cadmium selenide that can be applied using a one-step method to any conductive surface with efficiencies over 1%. 
However, the absorption of quantum dots QDs in QDSCs is weak at room temperature. The plasmonic nanoparticles can be utilized to address the weak absorption of QDs e.g., nanostars. Adding an external infrared pumping sources to excite intraband and interband transition of QDs is another solution. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Organic polymer solar cells. Organic solar cells and polymer solar cells are built from thin films typically 100 nanometers of organic semiconductors including polymers, such as polyphenylene vinylene and small molecule compounds like copper thalocyanine a blue or green organic pigment and carbon fullerenes and fullerene derivatives such as PCBM. They can be processed from liquid solution, offering the possibility of a simple roll-to-roll -roll printing process, potentially leading to inexpensive, large-scale production. In addition, these cells could be beneficial for some applications where mechanical flexibility and disposability are important. Current cell efficiencies are, however, very low, and practical devices are essentially non-existent. Energy conversion efficiencies achieved to date using conductive polymers are very low compared to inorganic materials. However, Kanaka power plastic reached efficiency of 8.3% and organic tandem cells in 2012 reached 11.1%. The active region of an organic device consists of two materials, one electron donor and one electron acceptor. When a photon is converted into an electron hole pair, typically in the donor material, the charges tend to remain bound in the form of an exciton, separating when the exciton diffuses to the donor acceptor interface, unlike most other solar cell types. The short exciton diffusion lengths of most polymer systems tend to limit the efficiency of such devices. Nanostructured interfaces, sometimes in the form of bulk heterojunctions, can improve performance. In 2011, MIT and Michigan State researchers developed solar cells with a power efficiency close to 2% with a transparency to the human eye greater than 65%, achieved by selectively absorbing the ultraviolet and near infrared parts of the spectrum with small molecule compounds. Researchers at UCLA more recently developed an analogous polymer solar cell, following the same approach, that is 70% transparent and has a 4% power conversion efficiency. These lightweight, flexible cells can be produced in bulk at a low cost and could be used to create power-generating windows. In 2013, researchers announced polymer cells with some 3% efficiency. They used block copolymers, self-assembling organic materials that arrange themselves into distinct layers. The research focused on P3HTB-PFTBT that separates into bands some 16 nanometers wide. Adaptive cells Adaptive cells change their absorption, reflection characteristics depending to respond to environmental conditions. An adaptive material responds to the intensity and angle of incident light. At the part of the cell where the light is most intense, the cell surface changes from reflective to adaptive, allowing the light to penetrate the cell. 
The other parts of the cell remain reflective, increasing the retention of the absorbed light within the cell. In 2014, a system was developed that combined an adaptive surface with a glass substrate that redirect the absorbed to a light absorber on the edges of the sheet. The system also includes an array of fixed lenses, mirrors to concentrate light onto the adaptive surface. As the day continues, the concentrated light moves along the surface of the cell. That surface switches from reflective to adaptive when the light is most concentrated and back to reflective after the light moves along. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Surface texturing. For the past years, researchers have been trying to reduce the price of solar cells while maximizing efficiency. Thin film solar cell is a cost-effective second-generation solar cell with much reduced thickness at the expense of light absorption efficiency. Efforts to maximize light absorption efficiency with reduced thickness have been made. Surface texturing is one of techniques used to reduce optical losses to maximize light absorbed. Currently, surface texturing techniques on silicon photovoltaics are drawing much attention. Surface texturing could be done in multiple ways. Etching single crystalline silicon substrate can produce randomly distributed square-based pyramids on the surface using anisotropic etchants. Recent studies show that CC wafers could be etched down to form nano-scale inverted pyramids. Multicrystalline silicon solar cells, due to poorer crystallographic quality, are less effective than single crystal solar cells, but MCC solar cells are still being used widely due to less manufacturing difficulties. It is reported that multi-crystalline solar cells can be surface textured to yield solar energy conversion efficiency comparable to that of monocrystalline silicon cells, through isotropic etching or photolithography techniques. Incident light rays onto a textured surface do not reflect back out to the air as opposed to rays onto a flat surface. Rather some light rays are bounced back onto the other surface again due to the geometry of the surface. This process significantly improves light to electricity conversion efficiency, due to increased light absorption. This texture effect as well as the interaction with other interfaces in the PV module is a challenging optical simulation task. A particularly efficient method for modeling and optimization is the OPTOS formalism. In 2012, researchers at MIT reported that CC films textured with nanoscale inverted pyramids could achieve light absorption comparable to 30 times thicker planar CC. In combination with anti-reflective coating, surface texturing technique can effectively trap light rays within a thin film silicon solar cell. Consequently, required thickness for solar cells decreases with the increased absorption of light rays. Topic: <laughs> Encapsulation. Solar cells are commonly encapsulated in a transparent polymeric resin to protect the delicate solar cell regions for coming into contact with moisture, dirt, ice, and other conditions expected either during operation or when used outdoors. The encapsulants are commonly made from polyvinyl acetate or glass. 
Most encapsulants are uniform in structure and composition, which increases light collection owing to light trapping from total internal reflection of light within the resin. Research has been conducted into structuring the encapsulant to provide further collection of light. Such encapsulants have included roughened glass surfaces, diffractive elements, prism arrays, air prisms, V grooves, diffuse elements, as well as multi directional waveguide arrays. Prism arrays show an overall 5% increase in the total solar energy conversion. Arrays of vertically aligned broadband waveguides provide a 10% increase at normal incidence, as well as wide-angle collection enhancement of up to 4%, with optimized structures yielding up to a 20% increase in short-circuit current. Active coatings that convert infrared light into visible light have shown a 30% increase. Nanoparticle coatings inducing plasmonic light scattering increase wide-angle conversion efficiency up to 3%. Optical structures have also been created in encapsulation materials to effectively cloak the metallic front contacts. Manufacture. <inaudible> 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 Solar cells share some of the same processing and manufacturing techniques as other semiconductor devices. However, the stringent requirements for cleanliness and quality control of semiconductor fabrication are more relaxed for solar cells, lowering costs. Polycrystalline silicon wafers are made by wire sawing block cast silicon ingots into 180 to 350 micrometer wafers. The wafers are usually lightly P-type doped. A surface diffusion of N-type dopants is performed on the front side of the wafer. This forms a p-n junction a few hundred nanometers below the surface. Anti-reflection coatings are then typically applied to increase the amount of light coupled into the solar cell. Silicon nitride has gradually replaced titanium dioxide as the preferred material, because of its excellent surface passivation qualities. It prevents carrier recombination at the cell surface. A layer several hundred nanometers thick is applied using PECVD. Some solar cells have textured front surfaces that, like anti-reflection coatings, increase the amount of light reaching the wafer. Such surfaces were first applied to single crystal silicon, followed by multi-crystalline silicon somewhat later. A full area metal contact is made on the back surface, and a grid-like metal contact made up of fine fingers and larger bus bars, a screen printed onto the front surface using a silver paste. This is an evolution of the so-called wet process for applying electrodes, first described in a U.S. patent filed in 1981 by Bayer AG. The rear contact is formed by screen printing a metal paste, typically aluminium. Usually this contact covers the entire rear, though some designs employ a grid pattern. The paste is then fired at several hundred degrees Celsius to form metal electrodes in ohmic contact with the silicon. Some companies use an additional electro plating step to increase efficiency. After the metal contacts are made, the solar cells are interconnected by flat wires or metal ribbons, and assembled into modules or solar panels. 
Solar panels have a sheet of tempered glass on the front, and a polymer encapsulation on the back. Manufacturers and certification National Renewable Energy Laboratory tests and validates solar technologies. Three reliable groups certify solar equipment, UL and IEEE both US standards and IEC. Solar cells are manufactured in volume in Japan, Germany, China, Taiwan, Malaysia and the United States, whereas Europe, China, the US, and Japan have dominated 94% or more as of 2013 in installed systems. Other nations are acquiring significant solar cell production capacity. Global PV cell – module production increased by 10% in 2012 despite a 9% decline in solar energy investments according to the annual PV status report released by the European Commission's Joint Research Centre. Between 2009 and 2013 cell production has quadrupled. Topic: China. Due to heavy government investment, China has become the dominant force in solar cell manufacturing. Chinese companies produced solar cells modules with a capacity of approximately 23 gigawatts in 2013, 60% of global production. Topic: Malaysia. In 2014, Malaysia was the world's third largest manufacturer of photovoltaics equipment, behind China and the European Union. Topic: United States. Solar cell production in the U.S. has suffered due to the global financial crisis, but recovered partly due to the falling price of quality silicon. Disposal <inaudible> 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 Solar cells degrade over time and lose their efficiency. Solar cells in extreme climates, such as desert or polar, are more prone to degradation due to exposure to harsh UV light and snow loads respectively. Usually, solar panels are given a lifespan of 25 to 30 years before they get decommissioned. The International Renewable Energy Agency estimated that the amount of solar panel waste generated in 2016 was 43,500 to 250,000 metric tons. This number is estimated to increase substantially by 2030, reaching an estimated waste volume of 60 to 78 million metric tons in 2050. Topic: <inaudible> Recycling. <inaudible> 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 In 2018, most decommissioned solar panels were sent to landfills. Recycling is limited because it is too expensive to process the low volume of solar panel waste. However, solar cells contain toxic materials like lead and cadmium which, when broken, could leach into the soil and contaminate the environment. With the volume of solar panel waste set to increase, the safety of disposing solar panels in landfills is becoming a big concern. 
Many manufacturers are turning to recycling solar panels instead. The first solar panel recycling plant opened in Rousset, France in 2018. It was set to recycle 1,300 tons of solar panel waste a year, and can increase its capacity to 4,000 tons. <laughs> See also